Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone to Sister Wives with Mary Jane Kay. Today, I'll be giving my commentary on Sister Wives, Season 17, Episode 5, The Last Family Gathering. The episode opens with Cody explaining that he and Christine are on the fast track now from separation to divorce. They have been for months. One thing I did notice is that Cody used to have a thing for affliction shirts, and now that penchant has switched to plaid, and a deep affection for soccer mom Karen Sunvisors. Cody is sporting just two wispy curls in front, and then there's no hairline. His hair starts so far back that it looks like his hair is pulled back with a phantom headband. I keep looking for the phantom headband that isn't there, just like Cody keeps looking for the phantom husband Christine is going to marry one day to steal all of his non-existent coins. Next, there's a scene of a pondering Kotex strolling through his field on the playground. He's going for a look of philosophical musings, pondering deeply, profoundly, but in reality, it looks like he's coping with severe constipation. Dolkalax can sponsor Cody. All he has to do is throw a hand on his stomach with that look on his face and he can make the coins just like he loves and then maybe, just maybe, he can pay off that land he was unable to pay off as of yet for the past three years with four other adults. He and Robin always seem to wear some pretty expensive watches. Robin and Cody can afford the mansion Cody was driving a different convertible sports car this season. Cody can afford the nanny. Maybe if Robin was less into herself and more into the family and the best financial interests of the family, they could pay off the land. Maybe if Robin was able to take a rental that had less than five bedrooms, which very few rentals have five bedrooms. That's like looking for a fucking unicorn or a leprechaun at the end of a rainbow. That was Robin's reason for needing the mansion. She couldn't find a five-bedroom rental, which they're virtually non-existent five-bedroom rentals. Now, then she wants to use that as an excuse why she needs the mansion, an over or close to a million dollar home, when if they were able to share a bedroom and scrimp and have a rental or have a, a smaller home, they would have a lot more money to help pay off Coyote Pass, which would have been really good for the family. It's crazy to me that the Browns would even buy that land without having some plan among the five adults to be able to functionally pay it off in a reasonable way. Uh, because before it's paid off, they can't even formally rezone the land to reset the lots of each individual parcel in order to build. And there is a permit process. There's a lot of fees. There's a lot to go through. This is so insane. Plus, they have to excavate get rid of the trees, water and power need to be brought in. I don't think Cody ever intended on building the land. I think this land, Coyote Pass, buying the property was just to sell the women on a pipe dream to get them to move to Flagstaff. Cody in the moment was impulsive, being the used car salesman he is. He wanted to sell it. He got this land knowing full well what type of a mess he was in practically and financially. He also knew the land needed to be excavated and rezoned, and he knew it needed permits and licensing and fees up the ass, not to mention bringing in water and power. That's why when the women argued over in the trees or out of the trees, and Cody had the conversation to try and patch things up with Christine and Janelle and Mary and Robin, Cody said, his lawyer told him they would get rich quick if they just made the land an investment property with rentals. Cody, I think, saw the writing on the wall. He knew he bit off more than he could chew. It was expensive bait buying Coyote Pass for his family and wives in order to attract them into this and make it more convenient for him so he got less pushback. He sold the dream. The wives did not want an investment property. They wanted the dream Cody sold them to come to fruition. They were all prepared at that point to live on that land and to build four homes there. Cody didn't move on it. He blamed the pandemic. He blamed his wife's bickering. He said he wanted two lots. Then they bought four lots. Then he wanted five lots, one for himself. 
And now that Christine has left and given up her peace, Cody says he wants his home and Christine's land to become investment properties. When originally, Cody was taking the plot with the drainage ditch to make sure the whole family had access to the pond at all times with no issues to access to prevent Mary from taking the land just in case there would be issues there. And now Cody wants that piece to be a rental property. Did Cody want that piece to protect the pond for the family's access? Or did he want that piece to make sure he could have an investment property? For Cody was having this piece of land, having his piece of land, the fifth house, the fifth parcel about access to the pond or was it about Cody wanting to build an investment property? Does Cody want his family living with strangers and tenants on their family land? The land that has access to the precious drainage ditch they call a pond? Why did Cody create confusion with Mary and Robin when they argued over plots telling them each different things about who wanted what? Why did Cody intentionally miscommunicate? Did he want to create confusion to delay the process, knowing full well his intention was not to build, knowing he was in for a lot, knowing he bit off far more than he could chew? Now Janelle is calling Cody's bluff. She has got the fifth wheel now. Cody sees this as his opportunity for monogamous bliss. His family are his obstacles to his goals in life. What goals? What goal? Monogamy with Robin, of course. Or complete authority so he can live monogamy with Robin and phone it in for a few hours whenever he so chooses, gracing the others, the peasants, with his presence when he feels like it, without one word of complaint, one sigh under their breath, one word about how he isn't doing things fair and equal as a husband and a father for his three wives and 18 kids. Cody's the patriarch, of course. He doesn't get pushback. He gets obedience. No one in the world but him has such high standards and expectations that only he is capable to reach. Kotex always knows best. Cody knows Janelle is mobile now. Her home is on wheels. She can move anytime she likes with no strings. And Cody knows if he doesn't build, if he doesn't make progress on the dream he sold the women, Janelle will leave. And it's easy for her. And my guess is he will push Janelle out next using the exact same toxic tactics and manipulations he tried on Mary and Christine. Christine left. Mary is still hanging on. I don't think Mary is hanging on just to be a thorn in Cody's side. In my opinion, she is hanging on because her whole identity is this family. She started this with Cody. And also, spiritually, I think this is a lot about the afterlife and her wanting to end up with her family in the afterlife if things go okay and Cody makes it to his planet. If Mary were to leave Cody in the afterlife, if Cody and the family, everything went well and Cody got to heaven and his wives were with him in heaven and his kids were there too, theoretically, if Mary leaves Cody and she spiritually unseals from him, that would mean that she wouldn't get to be with her family necessarily. Um, when they go to the afterlife. And I think that's a big concern for her because it's very specific about where you go in the afterlife and who you're with. And it's very specific in this faith. And if she believes in it and she grew up in it, she will feel like if she leaves Cody, maybe she won't get to have her place. And that might be something that keeps her in. That may be a reason why she stays. Cody wasn't a good husband to Mary. He did all he could to abandon Mary and to isolate her and to push her out. And I'm not saying Mary was easy to deal with. I'm sure there were a lot of complications because of some of her personality traits. But Cody is cruel, twisting the knife whenever possible. Cody makes it as inhospitable as possible to stay. What does Cody always say? He can't leave his wives, but they can leave him. And I think Cody wants to be freed from his obstacles to his goals in life. 
What goal would his family be an obstacle to for Cody, the self-proclaimed patriarch of these obstacles? His family should be the goal, the end all, be all. But Cody seems to have other goals. His family seems to keep him from achieving what goals Cody has. So what goals does Cody have? Could it be monogamy with Robin? Why does Cody create hoops to jump through that are all or nothing, refusing compromise and leveraging his presence as a father and a husband as a conditional reward for compliance? Because Cody wants to weasel his way out of what he signed up for. He wants to shy away and remove all accountability from himself. He wants to create his own self-imposed hurdles to him acting as a father and a husband. He wants to create barriers to his ability to be present that he knows are cruel, abusive, manipulative, and unfair, knowing they are impossible and knowing that his behavior as a father and a husband and his actions and words are less than anyone would accept as a wife or a child. So Cody can justify himself in not being there in his own mind with these hoops and then deeming it a lack of respect when people don't comply. He can then blame his wives and kids and their decisions as the reason and the justification as to why he cannot be there because they just won't sacrifice and make the effort. When he knows damn well, he is intentionally creating impossible obstacles and hoops to create a situation where he can then feel justified to himself in saying he can't be there without having to own his choices, take accountability, or hold up his end of what they all signed up for. Cody's a manipulator and he's abusive. And again, this is not at all on his wives and kids. This is not about their choices or the decisions they make. Cody is the one responsible to hold up his end of the deal, and he is responsible to do things fairly and equally in all of his houses. And he is responsible to be there as a father and a husband, unconditionally for all of his wives and kids. Whether or not things with each of his relationships are sunshine and sprinkles all of the time. Cody doesn't get to say there is a lack of respect when he refuses to compromise or treat his women as equals. He doesn't respect his kids. He doesn't respect his wives. I found it particularly cruel of Cody that while Mary was grieving, he felt comfortable suggesting that maybe she should move to the inn, pressuring her that maybe she should move to the inn, knowing how much something like that would hurt her or make her feel even worse. Instead of being supportive because he loved Bonnie as well and they shared a mutual love. I mean, Bonnie was Mary's mom. Of course, she's her confidant, her best friend, her mom. Cody really seemed to love and respect Bonnie. And Cody had a lot of losses in his life. He's lost his dad. He's lost his brother. He lost his mother-in-law, who is also his mom, uh, Janelle's mother. Cody has lost a lot of people in his life. He should have a little empathy. He should be a little sensitive, be a little more supportive. He understands grief. He understands loss and the pain and the suffering and the emotional toll. And he knows Mary is overwhelmed right now, trying to figure out the end. She, the marriage they have is terrible. Her mom just passed away. Christine is leaving. And Cody doesn't try to assuage and help and support Mary and lessen her suffering. He instead adds to it saying, why don't you stay at the inn? I don't need you. You don't need to be around. Stay away from me. Reinforcing that message that he wants nothing to do with her, that he won't touch her with a 10 foot pole. Is now the time for that type of cruelty and insensitivity, really? Cody isn't considerate at all. He's not sensitive at all. He doesn't understand any of what other people that he has relationships with in his family need or want from him. He refuses to compromise. He refuses to treat his women or kids as equals, even the adult kids. He always says there's a lack of respect if there's even one iota of pushback. Just because the women and the children refuse to bend the knee and they refuse to be conditionally loved based on compliance, and they refuse to be dictated to just so the person they signed up to do this with can reward them and grace them with their presence, uh, that doesn't mean that they're being disrespectful. 
Cody is incredibly insensitive. He's incredibly disrespectful to everyone around him. Refusal to comply with Cody and having no ability to be heard and no ability to use your voice as an equal partner, as an equal member of the family. That is not disrespect. Asking for compromise from Cody or sensitivity from Cody is not disrespect. When people behave in a way to deserve respect, they get respect. If people do not give respect, if they condescend, if they berate, if they treat you as less than, as if they are superior, they are the unquestioned authority. Even if you were ever to bend the knee, there will never be enough respect. The compliance isn't based on admiration and respect. If people are to submit and to comply, they're doing so based on fear and not wanting to make waves and wanting peace and wanting to avoid anything like a tornado. They walk on eggshells to prevent a tornado from popping up with Cody's shifting moods. If Kotex wants respect, he needs to get help and he also needs to behave in ways that show that he is worthy of respect and admiration. And he needs to give respect to his wives and kids. He needs to be humble. But Cody's overestimation of himself and his perception of himself is so warped. And his ego is so overinflated that he will never operate in reality if he keeps going like this. Cody lives in his own delusion. He can't see past it. Without help, there is zero chance Cody will ever be humbled. There is zero chance he will ever see past his own delusions to reality. Even with help, people with Cody's personality issues have a slim, slim sliver of a fraction of a percent of a chance to change at all. A leopard doesn't change its spots in my experience. As long as Kotex has enablers to his behavior, he won't ever hit rock bottom enough to even begin to think that maybe he is the issue. And it's not the people around him. It's not the lifestyle. It's not the faith. It's not this. It's not that. It's Cody that's the issue. Cody can continually create hoops to jump through. He can shift his expectations, continually moving the goalposts. But ultimately, if every enabler of Cody refused to play his game, there would be no game. Cody creates these hoops as excuses. And once he gets compliance, if he succeeds in getting people to play his game and give, he will inevitably make new hoops as excuses as barriers to him and access to him, as barriers to his presence and investment in each household. Why is Cody doing this? Because he doesn't want to be there and he doesn't want to do this anymore. And he doesn't have the balls or the spine or the testicular fortitude to be honest and tell the truth. Cody always says his wives can leave him, but he can't leave them. People complain about Mary. Why won't she just go? And I agree. If I was her, I would have left a long, 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 long time ago, way before the stupid fucking catfish. In season one, we see Mary crying, asking why she stays, what keeps her. And she says she stays for the family and for Leo. She says that at the time. Her commitment keeps her even though she is devastated in tears, even though way before the catfish, she knows she isn't getting what she deserves. I think Mary knows she will never get fulfillment and happiness with Cody. And I think she stays partially for her self-identity in the family. And I think if she leaves, she feels like her whole life was dedicated to a failure. And she started this thing with Cody. But also for Mary, there are the spiritual implications of leaving. In this faith, the afterlife is a big deal. And if Cody were to go to heaven, he is sealed to his wives and kids. And ideally, he would get a planet with all of his wives and kids. He is sealed to his wives. So if Mary were to unseal from Cody and if she were to leave and do it spiritually through the church, it's in her belief system that she would not be with her family in the afterlife. 
She won't get to be there with them. She won't get to see them. That's what the belief is. And if she is staying, it's probably because she wants to be with her people in heaven, if Kotex even gets there. So Mary is staying for a lot of reasons, I feel. And not that I would agree with her, not that I would stay myself, but I think Cody knows a lot of it is about the spiritual side effects of her leaving and the afterlife stuff. And Cody knows this and he is still cruel, even in a time of grief when she has just lost her best friend, her confidant, her mom, unexpectedly. And he's saying things like, why don't you move there? And it's just extra cruel. The reason I'm reiterating again about the afterlife is if she believes in this spiritually that her way to get to be with the kids, be with the family when she passes, because she is sealed, because she believes in this, is... If she stays, if she leaves, she doesn't get that. And if she doesn't get that, then what is she doing all of this for? So it's very difficult. And I find it particularly cruel the way Cody suggests things like she should live at the inn right while she's grieving her mom. It just shows Cody's character. And he knows she is staying probably for spiritual reasons. And yet he's doing all he can do to just, he can't even just leave her alone and leave her in peace. He's doing stuff to antagonize her and be particularly cruel. And that is so fucked up. Something to remember here too, is if Cody were to hypothetically go to hell for not doing the right thing, not living polygamy right, whatever, not doing things fair and equal as a husband, among other things, hypothetically, his wives would go to hell with him whether or not they deserve to, they aren't judged on their own merits and the contents of their characters and their souls. They are going to be judged based on Cody and they're going to go where Cody goes. And Mary probably really fears being separated from the kids. She may fear Cody also going to hell if she believes in this stuff spiritually. I would leave if I was Mary and I believe this stuff, knowing Cody might not get the planet and I might be stuck in hell. I would peace out, but I think for Mary, it's really a spiritual thing. She worries about that. For her, this is very real. And that's particularly why the way Cody goes out of his way to treat Mary so cruelly is really even worse. I think Cody knows he can behave any way he wants. He can be as insensitive as he wants, and he knows Mary will hang on. And I think in years, in many years, eventually she might leave. I really think once she sees that Christine left and the sky didn't fall, she might have a seed planted in her mind. I'm hoping, I mean, it's probably foolish to hope, but I think in years she might leave. And I think if Cody continues on at some point, she will have a breaking point and she will come to terms with her spirituality and with everything and her identity. I think with Christine deciding to say that she will not take a marriage like Mary's and her leaving and Cody's increasingly maniacal behavior in time, in years, and I'm talking years and years, Mary may leave. I think she questions it and I think she really doesn't like change. Now, Cody told Mary to live at the inn, that she should. He's encouraging that and I know he would love that. If Mary were in Parowan, off to the side, out of his immediate picture, and Janelle is in the fifth wheel, foot out the door with nothing to keep her, then Cody is closer to his goal in life of monogamy. He is closer to being free of his obstacles to his goals in life. And I think Cody will systematically push Janelle out. It's almost done, and eventually Mary will go in years. Mary will take years to get there. Mary seems to think that Cody doesn't get that she never intended to leave the family. Cody guilts her, making her feel he doesn't trust her intentions to stay. He doesn't trust her commitment. Mary perceives it as Cody misunderstanding her intention to stay or mistrusting her commitment. When he asks her to stay at the inn, that's not what it is. Cody wants her to stay there. It's his dream. He doesn't mistrust Mary or her commitment. He doesn't misunderstand her intention. He knows her intention is to stay. But it's Cody's dream that Mary stays there at the inn. And it's also practical in terms of solving who will run the inn. So Cody is really pushing it. He's encouraging it. He doesn't give a fuck about Mary or her commitment level. 
He even told her last tell-all that no one would accept a marriage like she has. But it's up to her. He is praying Mary goes. He has no interest in her commitment. He doesn't want her there. But Mary is thinking and believing that Cody doesn't understand it's not her intention. As if he is threatened by her having the end, that she will leave. As if he is worried about her staying or going. He is saying, I want you to go. Go, please, go, please stay at the end. And he wants to paint it as if he doesn't trust her commitment. So it puts the accountability and it puts the blame and the guilt on Mary. And so she questions herself because Cody makes it seem like he questions her in order to remove accountability from himself. He wants her to go and Mary knows this and she is refusing to go. And when she said episodes ago, it's her conscious decision to stay. I really think a lot of it is because of the afterlife stuff and the spiritual repercussions of her leaving. I don't know if deep down Mary naively thinks that maybe if she sticks around, she might be the last one standing with Robin and then he might decide to lean on Mary more when it's convenient for him and that maybe she will slowly, barely get back into the fold with him when he is sour with Robin or if it's the spiritual repercussions. But Mary can't be that dumb. She can't think that Cody actually questions her intentions and her commitment genuinely. She has to realize somewhere in there that Cody is doing that to manipulate her, to put the fault on her and to create more confusion. So he can put the accountability on her as if he doubts her when really he just wants Mary gone. One more obstacle down, so she's out of sight, out of mind, far, far away, so Cody can just live monogamy with Robin. Cody signed up for this, and wouldn't it be more dignified if he sat everyone down and he was honest that he can no longer manage what he signed up for, that he doesn't want to do it, that his heart's not in it, that he doesn't want to do more damage and hurt to his family, that he wants to keep things amicable but he wants to feel free of this. In the end, even if this guy hypothetically had all the power in the world and all the authority he wants over his family, even if he was the man, the absolute dictator of the family, and he was the loved and adored patriarch, and he was obeyed blindly and things were convenient for him, that's still not what Cody wants. Cody wants to be free. Cody wants monogamy deep down. And once Sol and Ari are grown, my guess is Cody wants to be free of that too. I don't think he wants to do this. And rather than to do all of this abuse and manipulation to try and make it easy on himself to get what he wants in life without honesty and without him humbling himself to take accountability, being real and open with his family, Cody prefers to manipulate and calculate and create layers upon layers of hoops. Cody prefers to deflect when the truth will come out and the truth might sting, but it will hurt less than all of this. The more Cody does this, the more unhinged he will become and the more he is inflicting pain and trauma and stress and damage on his 18 kids, three wives, and his ex-wife who is now free. Hopefully one day when Christine wants, if she wants, she will find a man who isn't a dick face with a full head of hair and lots of coins, who at least has the dignity and the self-respect to cut his head of hair when his age has told him it's time to let go. It's time to let go of his ego. It's time to let go of his vanity. It's time to let go of his pride. And it's time to accept himself as he is and be real. Christine will find that guy, like attracts like. So she will find an authentic soul who knows himself, who accepts her as she is. And when she does, Cody will be so out of sorts that it will catalyze a regular bowel movement for him so he can get rid of the permanent look of constipation he sports on his face. And then he can do commercials for adult depends and make all the coins. He's always stewing in resentment. He always looks so heavy and bitter. Like he hasn't had a normal bowel movement in years. 
He never, ever looks just chill or okay or relaxed or comfortable in his skin. And it's hard to live in a lie. And it's hard to always assume the worst and play everything like a game, always calculating how to benefit, always calculating who's going to come at him next. It's harder to live inauthentically than to just be real. Imagine the weight and the stress and the poison in your guts when you do things the right way, when you are authentic. Even if you have a struggle in life, it's not so hard because when you are on a right path, there isn't all this extra weight. There isn't all this constipation. There isn't resistance. You glide. Has Cody ever glided? When was the last time Cody was authentic? When was the last time Cody was genuinely happy? When was the last time Cody was honest with himself? In confessional, Cody says, the last time the family got together was when Christine told him she was leaving. And when Christine told the adults she was leaving Cody and moving to Utah, Cody feels very separate from the family. Even with he and his relationship with Janelle and with Robin and the kids, he has struggled through this process. Cody is trying to deal with it, but he has other problems coming up. One thing I noticed is the music in this episode. It's very dramatic, like a true crime documentary or a Lifetime movie. It's very suspenseful. It's very ominous in places. It makes you anxious, wondering who is going to snap first. It doesn't suit the show at all or this episode. I don't know who does the music, but it overdoes the dramatic effect and it ruins it rather than building up suspense. Janelle has to move. She is buying an RV and Cody has to figure out how to get it onto the property. He has to head to Janelle's to figure it out. In confessional, Janelle reveals she went with Cody to pick up this truck a week ago. It can pull a lot and it can pull her trailer. Cody arrives and Cody and Janelle kiss on the mouth quickly. It's a quick peck and it looks so freaking awkward. Like these two are just paid actors who don't know anything about each other. They have no spark between them. They have no connection whatsoever. The kiss didn't look organic. It was weird. These two have six kids together and they are husband and wife for far over 20 plus years. And that kiss didn't even seem like they knew each other. Like it was as if they found two extras and said, greet her with a kiss. They looked very uncomfortable with each other. They looked very unfamiliar. They looked like paid actors. They didn't look like husband and wife. Robin has confessional next, and she always does this downturn frown where her lips curl downward when she's displeased. She kind of reminds me of Mr. Potato Head or Bert from Bert and Ernie of Sesame Street. He just has a look that's kind of like Robin when she gets that frustrated face. Anyways, she does her usual really weird downward frown that she does when she is displeased and she complains that Cody bought this truck and Cody told her they have to buy a truck to move the trailer. And Robin said, no, he doesn't need to buy a truck. She seems pissed about this truck. Why? I wonder if it's because Cody and Janelle maybe got alone time to travel to buy the truck. Robin has no right to complain about anything Cody does to assist another one of his wives. She has no right to put her two cents in about any purchases he makes with another wife. She gets a mansion because they could not find a five bedroom rental to her liking. She gets a nanny and she only contributes her fifth of the filming paycheck to the finances. She doesn't work separately like all the other wives or Cody. Christine works separately, Mary as well, Janelle, and even Cody, although thinking of Cody with guns and gun accessories is a scary thought with his behavior, Cody does work outside of filming. Robin is the only one who doesn't work outside of filming. She doesn't pitch in to the family finances or to do anything other than her fifth of the filming paycheck. So why in the fuck? Is she giving her input on Cody getting the truck and buying the truck to pull the trailer or Cody helping out Janelle? Is Robin pissed? Maybe Cody took time away from her 
to go with Janelle and to help Janelle? What's a truck in comparison to her mansion and her nanny? Plus, Janelle is a grown-ass mature woman who is practical and intelligent. She has a strong work ethic. She's educated. She's business-minded. She's financially astute. Janelle is capable to pay for herself completely. She doesn't live beyond her means like Robin. And Robin is the queen of financial inefficiency. She's the queen of laziness when it comes to working and financially contributing. Robin lives way beyond her means. She can't live independently and be able to pay for her life independent of Cody. She can't rely on herself financially to live independently. And she wants to comment on what Janelle and Cody are doing or what Janelle does or if they need to buy the truck. She has no business commenting on what Cody and Janelle do or on what Cody does to help Janelle, even if it's buying a truck. I don't think she has a right. She can go get beeped. I think Robin could have lived in a four bedroom rental just fine or even a three bedroom rental. Her kids could have shared. She didn't really need five bedrooms. She didn't really need the mansion. So whether or not Janelle and Cody need to buy the truck, is irrelevant. It's not something she should be speaking on. She could have managed in a smaller rental with less than five bedrooms and she knows that. She didn't need to buy the mansion. Janelle didn't comment on this, although being so intelligent and practical and financially aware, Janelle knows Robin didn't need to buy that mansion and she zipped it. And maybe Robin should zip it too about this truck. Just a thought. In confessional, Cody explains the truck used to be his late brother's. It has sentimental value. Cody always wanted it, and when his sister-in-law was ready to part with it, she knew Cody was interested because of the sentimental value. And so Cody bought the truck from her at a time when it probably not only helped his sister-in-law financially, but it also had sentimental value for Cody to have his brother's truck and to keep it in the family. And it also served a purpose. Janelle needed to move the trailer and realistically, she will have to move the trailer every 120 days per the county laws. So she will need a truck to move her trailer every four months. So it's good to have a truck on hand that can move the trailer. I see nothing wrong or impractical with Cody purchasing that truck with Janelle. I can understand the sentimental value. I can understand the benefit to everyone involved. Renting a truck every four months for a year or more will cost about the same over time. It seems far more practical to me than Robin buying the mansion. Buying the truck gave Cody joy and it will pull the RV. Cody explains to Janelle that a couple of things have happened that indicated he could use a bigger truck, but not all of the time. And he doesn't like having equipment that he doesn't use. Janelle suggests that she will drive the truck. She loves it. Cody says he doesn't want to wear out the truck on soccer mom stuff. It's interesting that Cody mentions soccer mom stuff when he is the one always sporting the soccer mom Karen sun visor. Janelle tells Cody not to complain to her then, that he doesn't want to have equipment that he doesn't use, and she says she will use it. She's happy to use it. One thing I noticed is Cody always wears those gloves. I don't know if he wears them as driving gloves or to protect his tender hands from manual labor, but with all the intense true crime music, the dramatic music, the gloves make me think of, if it doesn't fit, you must acquit. If Cody one day, hypothetically, were to lose it, would he wear those gloves? Is the Mark Furman of Flagstaff going to find a lone glove on Coyote Pass behind the trailer? Will Cody probably say it's a frame up? The law enforcement and the legislature in Utah are after him and now they got him and they framed him. It was Christine. It was this. It was that. I could see it now. They did this to me. They framed me. They made me look like I did this. I didn't do it. Then they will take Cody for his mental evaluation and he will be found incompetent to stand trial. 
I feel like I want to write a screenplay about a crazy polygamist motherfucker going apeshit on his wives. Janelle loves the truck. She says the truck is big, but she can figure it out. It's as big as Caleb and Maddie's truck, and she says Maddie can drive that thing like a boss. So Janelle feels she can do it too. I could see a woman like Janelle accomplishing anything she sets her mind to easily. She's ambitious. She's intelligent. She's determined. She could drive a big rig if she wanted. Robin says, it's a funny thought to think of Janelle driving around Flagstaff in that big truck. It's a funny thought to me that Robin did her eyebrows like that and her hair in sausage curls. And she looked in the mirror and she decided she was good with it, not only to be out and about, but to go on camera and film like that. I just want to reach into my TV screen and separate those curls. Her hair looks unfinished. It's not funny for Janelle to drive a big truck. It's badass. In college, I had a friend who was this tiny girl. She had a truck. It's nothing funny or out of the ordinary. She had this huge lifted truck and she could drive it no problem. And Janelle can totally drive that truck. What's funny is that hair and those eyebrows and that downward frown she does when she wants to judge others and be critical of others. Robin is ridiculous to think it's funny. Janelle is an absolute badass. It's not funny at all. If Janelle wants to drive a truck, she could drive the truck. No problem. Janelle can do anything she wants to do. It's not funny. It's not out of the ordinary. What's out of the ordinary are those eyebrows and that hair and that frown that she does. Janelle is more than capable. She's independent. Janelle says that you can figure out anything with time and practice. Goblin says that she's heard funny stories about Janelle struggling to drive big vehicles and to do things and stuff like that. So Robin doesn't know. And then she chuckles and she does her ridiculous frown. You know what? I don't know about that hair and those eyebrows, but I do know Janelle can drive that truck. And Robin doubting Janelle and putting her down, saying it's funny to think of Janelle driving that big truck around. And she's heard stories of Janelle not being able to drive big vehicles. All of that is insulting and it's condescending. And rather than empowering Janelle woman to woman, Robin seems to want to express doubt that Janelle can do this as if Janelle is stupid to even try. That's not very sister wifely of her, is it? And she always wants to give her two cents of doubt and dismissal of Janelle and of Janelle's abilities. But Robin is probably pissed that Cody bought the truck against her wishes and that he did it for Janelle and he went with Janelle to get the truck so it took time away from her. I think it's also interesting that Robin is supposedly the empath who is sentimental and sensitive. She wants to teach the family to be more sensitive. She wants her kids to be sensitive, yet she can't understand Cody's sentimental attachment to the truck his late brother drove, and she seems just fine to insult Janelle and doubt her abilities as if Janelle is incapable to drive the big truck as if the notion of a woman driving a big truck is funny. She asked Janelle before if they could be closer, and Janelle had to think about it. And Robin claims she wonders why Janelle and Gabe and Garrison don't take her calls. Maybe this is an example of why. It's funny to me, not that Janelle will be driving a big truck, but that Robin thinks it's acceptable to call Isabel stupid for going back to school in person this season. Robin continually puts down Gabe and Garrison. She puts down the kids. She thinks it's okay to call Isabel stupid. Yet she wants to complain that no one accepts her in this family. Oh, she's the Brown family scapegoat. Her mom calls her the Brown family scapegoat. She's all about the family. But she has no trouble calling Isabel stupid as the empath that she supposedly is. She has no problem disparaging Gabe and Garrison. That's funny. That's weird. Especially for a so-called sensitive empath who supposedly instills sensitivity 
in the family and in her kids. It's funny how insensitive she is to the kids in the family and to her sister wives. Robin always does these little side comments and then she wants to appear to be a sensitive empath. Remember when she told Mary to burn her marriage certificate after Mary sacrificed her legal marriage for Robin and when she made the comment about Christine that it's harder for older women to have babies she has heard when Christine is barely less than six years older than Robin, if that. Then Robin runs her mouth about the kids constantly and she wonders why no one accepts her in the family and why she isn't close to her sister wives. Cody wants to go out to the property with Janelle to figure out specifically where they want the home site. Instead of all that, why not come up with a plan to pay off the property first? Because nothing can be done until it's paid off. It doesn't even matter yet where the house will go or where the supposed casita will go until the land is paid off and the land is formally rezoned and they get permits and on and on. So why not first pay the land off and tackle that? It doesn't matter where anything will go till the land is paid for in full. Janelle is moving into the trailer in six weeks. She has to be out of the rental in just six weeks. Janelle's vision for the property is they will start with a casita. It's a popular thing there in Flagstaff. It's a detached garage with a living space above it. And in a couple of years, they will build the bigger house. It's May already and Janelle is moving onto the property at the end of June. She hopes to break ground by the winter time. Cody asks if Janelle has sorted what she is taking when she moves into the RV. And we learn Janelle is only taking three suitcases worth of stuff. Christine says Janelle is moving into a house the size of her kitchen and living room. Robin doesn't see Cody doing well in the trailer. She says there isn't anything out there. It's just bare land. What an astute and profound observation Robin makes that it's just bare land on Coyote Pass. Christine says Janelle will figure it out. If she wants to do something bad enough, she will do it. Cody complains that he doesn't want to put all of his stuff in storage and there won't be room at Janelle's trailer. So he had to move all of his stuff from Janelle's to Robin's house since there won't be room in the trailer. Christine explains that Cody has a lot of stuff. He always has. In Vegas, he had four houses to keep his stuff in and he had four of everything or more. And now he doesn't have his stuff at Mary's house or at her house and he can't have his stuff at Janelle's house anymore now that she's going to be living in the trailer. So Christine says Cody's stuff is either at Robin's house or in storage. And Christine has no idea where Cody puts his stuff. Cody tells Janelle they are under the gun. They need to go look at the property to figure it out. Janelle tells Cody the biggest question is where are they going to put the trailer? Janelle saw a space that she thinks works really well. Cody says they might need more than one space though. And Janelle agrees because of course they have to move the trailer every 120 days. Every four months, the county has a rule that you can only keep an RV or a trailer on your property for 120 consecutive days. So to avoid this, Janelle's plan is she should be done building in a year or so. So in that year, she needs to move her trailer every 120 days to somebody else's parcel of Coyote Pass so they stay within the county code. Cody needs to find someone to pour gravel. He says he needs a backhoe. Janelle wants to move the trailer directly onto the property. In confessional, Cody says they should have never bought the RV because they're going to be moving it all of the time. That land is out in the middle of nowhere. I doubt anyone will check the physical location of the trailer, especially in the middle of the winter months. It's good to follow the rules, but I wonder, since this is all owned within the family, unless the family reports it, if the county 
would even notice the trailer was out there. It's not parked in some obvious driveway of some residential neighborhood. So I don't think it's going to be that big of a deal, even if they do have to move the trailer. It's still staying on the same land. Technically, they just have to move it a couple hundred feet to a different parcel every time when the time comes. It's not that big a deal. Cody wants Janelle to get permission from her sister wives when it comes to every little aspect of everything they are doing when it comes to the property. In confessional, Cody reveals he is struggling because he is not optimistic about how this is going to come together. He says Janelle has to ask permission to be on somebody else's property. In confessional, Janelle is frustrated. She says this is typical Cody, like he is all on board for something and then he goes away for a couple of days and he comes back and he is like, oh my God, we've got all these problems. You got to ask your sister wives, blah, blah, blah. Janelle asks, why, why, frustratedly. She says she doesn't need their permission. They've already agreed. Janelle is very expressive here and she says she doesn't have time for this. It sounds to me, since we know Cody only stays at Robin's most of the time and Janelle's placed rarely and Mary and Christine are off the table in his rotation, he is never at Christine's or Mary's house. That Janelle is saying when Cody is at her place, they talk and they finalize things and then Cody goes away to Robin's for a couple of days and he vacillates and then he starts flip-flopping and he comes up with all of these problems and concerns and issues and the agreement they made is no longer agreed on. Cody adds other barriers based on the whisperings of Robin, in my opinion, and Cody creates more barriers to what they agreed on. Janelle asks why, and the why is because Cody is talking with Robin and she influences him, and the why is because Cody intentionally creates hoops when he doesn't want to do what he agreed to, when he doesn't want to be inconvenienced, when he doesn't want to do what he signed up for when it becomes inconvenient for him he creates issues he creates hoops and he shifts the goalposts to create constant confusion and constant contingencies so he doesn't have to show up and make the effort and he can avoid doing what he should or what he said he would do this is just cody's typical way to weasel out of it in confessional mary asks what if I don't want an RV pad in that spot that Janelle just decides to put her trailer temporarily? Just excavate it out. Move the gravel. Who cares? They have to excavate the whole thing anyway and get rid of a lot of the rocks and the trees when they build, if they build. In confessional, Robin says there is a part of her that wonders if Cody and Janelle are out there, will they start formulating ways to get these pieces paid off? so they can get started? Robin wonders, maybe this will be good. Cody says, there are things that Janelle does frequently that aren't like a married husband and a wife do. They do things separately. In confessional, Janelle says, Cody is no longer advocating. He's no longer acting as her husband here. Janelle tells Cody she has to run and do some errands. Cody looks constipated as usual. Cody goes to grab the trailers and the boys are going to help him load the piano tonight. In confessional, Cody says, Janelle wants to get moving. She wants to get something done. And he is resistant because there are a lot of things to do in that process. And it starts with asking other people if she can park her RV on their property. And Cody isn't asking for her. Janelle is candid in this episode. She says they bought the property three freaking years ago. They should have figured this out already. She mocks Cody in a voice and she says sarcastically, well, maybe we should get together and talk about it again. And Janelle says, no, you guys figure out what you need to do with your lots because I'm going to move forward with mine. See, I think Janelle can see the writing on the wall. She sees Cody's pattern and she knows Cody will probably try hard to push her out next with the same pattern he used on Mary and Christine. And Janelle is calling Cody's bluff, saying, let's build now. We invested in this. We invested in this land. 
The money is tied up and it's supposed to be to build on this land for us to have homes together on this land and it's still not paid off. I think Janelle is seeing if Cody's gonna move on the land. I think she wants to move and make progress. She bought the RV, she is living on the land now. She's making progress on her piece. Cody will either get his ass in gear and figure out how to pay off the land with Janelle and he will move forward and make progress after Janelle takes this initiative or Cody won't and she will already be in a position in that trailer to move anywhere she likes if the property falls through. I think Janelle knows it probably will and I think she is forcing Cody shit or get off the pot and now his hands are tied and he has no other option. He can either make progress with the wives to pay off the land to build or he will push Janelle out to avoid building because in my opinion, he clearly has no intention to build for homes to live in, maybe for rental properties. But I don't think Cody has any desire to build up Coyote Pass and to live there with his remaining wives. Janelle explains she won't have a home in six weeks. She couldn't find any rentals. She bought the trailer and she will be out there on the land in six weeks. Cody and Janelle meet with the experts at Coyote Pass to talk and weigh in before they start building to see what needs to be done. They are planning where the gravel will be, where the RV will be best suited, where the driveway might be. And Cody says this has to be very satisfactory to Janelle because she has finally pushed them to the point where they are making a plan for something. Cody says there is a method to Janelle's madness. But it's very dangerous to try and push around people who are resistant to what you are trying to push. If they all want to build and they've had this land for three years with no progress and they still haven't even paid it off to be able to take steps to make progress and they supposedly all want to build, why is everyone so resistant if this is what they all want? It indicates that they don't all want to build, especially Cody. Also, it's ironic that it's Cody saying it's very dangerous to push around people who are very resistant to what you're trying to push. What does Cody do every fucking episode? He pushes around his family constantly, manipulating them and pushing them and constantly pressuring them to follow his rules with no compromise. He pushes them to jump through his hoops that are constantly moving to bend the knee and obey, submit blindly without question to his will, to his way, to be dictated to, to shove his COVID mandates down everyone's throats. And if you don't acquiesce, he labels it as disrespect. You are shunned, you are cleaved off, you're an inconvenience, you're disrespectful. It's interesting that when it's convenient, when others are pushy, Cody then says it's dangerous. It's dangerous to push people around who are resistant to what you're trying to push. As long as the person pushing isn't him, then it's dangerous. But when Cody pushes and people are resistant, then it's not dangerous. It's disrespect to not go along with it. So it's okay if the patriarch pushes, but it's dangerous when it's one of his wives doing the pushing. So it's okay for Cody to push his will on others. It's okay for Cody to dictate. It's okay for him to shove his protocols down everyone's throats. That's not dangerous. Even when the family resists, that's okay. They are disrespectful. He's the patriarch. It's perfectly fine for him to push. But for a wife to assert herself and move forward and demand progress on the homes, that's dangerous. It's dangerous to push for progress. It's dangerous for her to push forward for herself and the family in having homes when the family is resistant. She can't have her own will or assert herself. It's dangerous when a wife does that, but it should be completely acceptable when Cody shoves his will on everyone as the patriarch and everyone just needs to bend down unquestioningly and take it. That's perfectly fine. Then resistance to that is disrespect. Then resistance is a ludicrous notion that's just preposterous because Cody is the patriarch after all. God forbid a wife gets too independent. That's dangerous.
Mary says, from what she understands, there isn't anything that can be done yet because they have to pay for the property first. There are lots of steps still and Mary doesn't know how fast that will happen. Christine doesn't want anything to do with Coyote Pass. She says it's not her land, it's their land and they can do whatever they want with it. Robin says, there has been this idea of Janelle hopping pieces of property, that kind of a thing, and it really hasn't been talked about a lot. It's just kind of happening. That's Robin's two cents as she chuckles dismissively. Robin wants to point out that Janelle hasn't considered anyone's feelings, that she hasn't discussed it. She's just doing what she wants. It's just happening. Janelle has taken over. I'm sure that's not the case, but Robin probably wants to help Cody paint the narrative that Janelle is being bossy and independent, doing as she pleases without consulting the group. Janelle and Cody already discussed it. They already agreed to it. And now Cody and Robin want to point out that Janelle hasn't gotten permission. She hasn't discussed it with the wives. She hasn't discussed moving her RV onto their parcel. Even Mary chimed in that she may not want an RV pad. They want to make Janelle seem like she isn't a team player, like she is this independent, loose cannon, when she has discussed this with Cody at length, probably many times. And she probably mentioned it to the other wives. And it was probably okay. And then Robin whispered and whispered some more. And Cody doesn't want to build. And now he feels he either has to scramble to pay off the land or Janelle will have ultimately called his bluff. This is about Cody refusing to take accountability for his shit financial planning. And rather than Cody explaining why in three years there was no progress and the land still isn't being paid off, saying, well, Janelle is just doing this without getting permission. She's the one making a complication. She's the one being so inconvenient. She's the one being so impulsive. That's all deflection instead of Cody himself explaining why he hasn't made progress with the land because he genuinely has no intention of building. In confessional, Cody says he's trying to sit here and figure out why Janelle thinks they will be able to do this. Janelle tells Cody for her, it's about building fast. Cody then makes more excuses. He mentions cost of lumber prices, and he asks the experts, is that really impacting the overall cost nowadays? Of course, the expert Ken says yes. And another expert says, oh yeah, it's the cost of everything right now. Cody knows Janelle is financially savvy and she's business minded. She's very economical and practical. So he is mentioning inflation and the higher costs of things now as a way to try and persuade Janelle to hold her horses on this. As if, if she waits a while, things will magically be cheaper in just a few short months with the snap of a finger. See, Janelle saying her main concern is to build fast is a major threat to Cody. So he wants to lessen that threat to find justifiable ways to buy more time. Like, we need to ask the wives if you can put your trailer there. And now he's mentioning the overinflated prices of everything. He thinks if he mentions it, just maybe it'll persuade Janelle. Janelle says she feels like where there's a will, there's a way. She says she's been saving her money. She has been scrimping and saving and sacrificing so she can build. She doesn't have any place to live right now. She bought this trailer. She is going to try and make it happen. And she thinks it's time that the family prioritizes paying off the property. Mary is at Lizzie's Heritage Inn and she says it's been four weeks yesterday since her mom passed away. Her mom was living at the inn running the B&B. Her death was sudden and unexpected. Mary is sad and she says her mom's clothes were still sitting on her bed and Mary just didn't even want to move them. It's been hard trying to figure out life without her mom, trying to figure out what to do and how to do it. Christine says Bonnie's passing was a huge shock. She had no idea Bonnie was even sick. 
Janelle says Bonnie was vibrant. She was running the BNB, and then she got sick one day, like she had the flu, and within a week, she was gone. It was her heart. It was shocking. Cody loved Bonnie. He says she was a dear part of the family. It was sudden. Mary has her ups and downs, and this week has been a down. Mary shut the end down. She needed time to grieve and to figure out what to do. Cody told Mary the other day, why don't you just move up there? And Mary chuckles. She says that was not her intention. Robin chimes in here during her confessional scene. She says, well, Cody probably didn't mean this in a bad way, but at the same time, she acknowledges it could be completely misunderstood to a point where it's insensitive. So it's not that it's actually insensitive at face value. It could be misperceived as insensitive. She says, Cody does think out loud. He has a tendency to process and be creative out loud. She says it's frightening sometimes and not even sensitive. She admits it was something that did not need to be said. Robin admits Cody should not have even said that to Mary but that Cody often thinks out loud, so he impulsively just says what's on his mind. And it can be insensitive and it can be frightening. He probably didn't mean it like that. It can easily be misunderstood. And then she admits he probably shouldn't have even said it. But if Cody is speaking without filtering off the top of his head and it's harsh, it's the unadulterated truth. It's Cody unfiltered. Robin says it's frightening, it's insensitive. To me, that means when Cody leaks this stuff, he is saying his honest, authentic, genuine truth. And he should be honest, even if it's harsh. He knows he prefers Mary to stay at the inn. He wants her to stay at the inn. He would definitely prefer it. And now that she needs someone to run the inn, it should be her, it's practical. Then Cody will have his dream. Mary will be out of sight, out of mind. Janelle will have the mobile trailer. She'll be on her way out. She won't be permanently attached to Flagstaff. She won't have a home in Flagstaff. Mary will be out of sight, distanced from him, far away in Parowan if she stays at the inn. Christine is gone, so Cody knows if Mary would just stay at the inn, he could easily have monogamous bliss with Robin. I wonder what frightening and sensitive stuff has Cody told Robin privately? Is Cody being insensitive when he verbal diarrheas or is he being more honest in these moments than ever? Maybe what frightens Robin is she can see how selfish and cruel and manipulative and unhinged Cody is. She can tell he wants monogamy with her. She can tell how angry he is, how bitter and how resentful he is how miserable and unhappy he is. And she has buyer's remorse in some small part of her, realizing his dream is to live monogamously with her, and I don't think she knows if she wants that 24-7. It's a lot to deal with him 24-7. It's a lot to deal with. It's a lot of walking on eggshells. It's a lot of moods. It's a lot of stroking of egos. Maybe she isn't wanting the mask off Cody around 24-7. Maybe the thought of having this Cody all to herself is starting to frighten Robin because she realizes she can only manipulate him so much. She may not always just be the favorite who can do no wrong in his eyes. And when he just has Robin to contend with, she won't hold as much favor with Cody. Maybe Robin realizes Cody is just as capable to treat her the way he treats his other wives. Maybe she is scared that she took this too far in enabling Cody so much and in being so submissive. Maybe she's wondering, what is life gonna be like when she is the only wife left and he directs his resentment and anger at her when it's down to Robin or himself and they're having issues and she isn't so convenient anymore. Maybe she wonders, will Cody blame her and direct his anger at her? Will he deflect to her before he ever looks inward at himself? Before he ever even takes a shred of accountability? 
Will Robin wonder how much her enabling Cody and stroking his ego created this monster she sleeps next to at night? Christine makes it clear that she never thought Mary planned to live in Parowan, and she says Mary has made that so abundantly clear. She says Mary bought the inn to keep it in her family, not to live there, and she has made that abundantly clear multiple times, Christine reiterates. I think Christine knows that Cody is trying to manipulate Mary by suggesting he doubts her intentions to make her feel guilt as if it's on her. If she moves, Cody wants Mary to move and he suggests it and then he acts surprised when she says she isn't moving to make Mary feel he doubts her. So the guilt is on her when she always made it clear from the start she never had that intention to live at the inn or to move there. Cody wants Mary to go, and he knows that, and everyone knows that too. But he puts it on Mary as if he doubts her commitment, as if he doubts her intentions. Like he doubts why she bought the inn in the first place, as if she bought the inn with the specific intention to move there. Then, when he pushes Mary out, and she lives there in years because... It will take years for Mary to progress and develop to a point, if she does, in leaving Cody. He can then say, see, I told you, she bought the inn to leave me. She bought the inn to live there. I knew it. Cody is just hoping and praying he can get Mary out of his hair and away living at that inn. I think eventually, eventually, Mary will consider leaving and it will take years. But I think now that Christine left and she put her foot down and said, I can't tolerate this. I deserve more. If Cody continues down the patriarchy path, if Mary can get past the spiritual fear she has about the afterlife, and if she can get past her whole identity being wrapped up in the family, she will leave, but it will take time. It will take years. It will be slow. It will take years still. But I think with Christine leaving and Mary's mom's passing and Cody continuing to devolve and become more unhinged, Mary will slowly, slowly, at a snail's pace, get there. But it will be a slow process. Janelle says Mary has not been interested in permanently living at the inn. And she says from the very beginning, Mary said... She didn't want to live at the inn, and she told Cody that. She made it clear that it isn't her intention to live there. And Cody was surprised by that. Mary says Cody was very surprised when she said she didn't intend to move to the inn. Mary says she was here at the very beginning. She helped start this family. It was herself and Cody from the start. They had plans. He loved her. Mary says for Cody to just tell her to go up there, she says no. She says it doesn't make sense. She says Cody is still in this place where he thinks the point of her buying this was to get away and that saddens her a lot. Cody says the reason he is suggesting this to Mary is that as a family, it doesn't feel like they interact that much anymore, honestly, and he isn't trying to push her away but she is laying this struggle at his feet and what to do about the end now that her mom has passed. So Cody felt here is a solution for her. And wouldn't it be great and convenient for Cody if Mary staying at the inn happened to be a solution for him too? Mary says if Cody or anybody else in the family thinks she wants to move there, she laughs and she says she feels bad that after so long, they're having this conversation. Mary says when she married Cody and then Janelle entered the family and Christine and Robin, they all had this ideal that they could survive anything and get through everything. And Mary wants to have those conversations. Mary wants to have those relationships. Mary thinks things can be healed where people want to heal them. And if they don't, Mary doesn't know what their family is going to look like. Mary feels that she is doing all she can to reassure people she isn't going anywhere. Mary says Christine telling them she was leaving and moving to Utah really affects her. Dealing with all this 
plus the BNB, plus losing her mom, plus the conflict with Cody, she has a lot going on that she needs to figure out. Mary says she needs to figure out what it is that she can control, that she can get through. Mary doesn't know what to do. She feels lost. She feels empty. She feels like she has to figure out a lot of stuff and she doesn't know how to figure it out. And the inn feels empty without her mom there. So she has a lot to figure out and she'll keep working on it. She says some days she feels better and she can go out and see people. She can put on a brave face. And on some days she just doesn't want to and she just doesn't feel capable. So she just stays in her house. I can relate to how Mary feels. She has so much to deal with and so much to process that she feels weighed down. She feels overwhelmed and she doesn't know how to cope. She feels sad. She feels stressed. She feels uneasy. She has so much to work out and she doesn't even know where to start and she just wants to be alone in her cocoon, in her safe environment, away from the world to sort things out. She isn't happy and she doesn't feel like pretending to be sprinkles and rainbows. She doesn't feel like putting on a show. So she ends up being stagnant and staying home where she feels comfortable, where she can just be as she is without having to plaster on a smile. And on top of this, she lost her confidant in her mom and she has not many people to talk to. She has Leo and Leo has their life and I'm sure that they do their best to be supportive of Mary. But it's not enough. Mary doesn't have a partner in life. She doesn't have a best friend that's always there to support her in her husband and in the members of her family. Cody should be more involved even just as a friend as the mother of the kid they share. Cody can do more and he can be more supportive of Mary in this time rather than taking this opportunity to encourage her to isolate herself far away and live at the inn. Her mom just passed. And Cody seems to feel that this is a great time to encourage Mary to live at the inn, away from him, away from her whole support system when she needs the support system the most, so that he can have what he wants. And he also wants to deflect and emotionally manipulate Mary at the worst time of her life when she's the most vulnerable and emotionally distraught. He wants to emotionally manipulate Mary as if he has been so distrustful of her commitment to stay and so distrustful of her reason in buying the inn that he is now shocked she hasn't moved there. He wants to encourage Mary to move there and put more stress on her at her most difficult time. And then he wants to put all of the accountability on Mary saying, I told you so, I knew you planned to live there, to put this on her as if she isn't all in when he wants her to go and he is putting guilt on her because he knows she still loves him and in encouraging her to move, which is what he wants, he wants her to feel like she does stuff to make him question her. And if she wants to stay. And Cody knows this is all just manipulative bullshit. It's a total toxic mindfuck and he could lay off from his toxic fuckery while Mary grieves her mom. Or he could do better and be supportive of someone he's known most of his life. But Cody's far too selfish to have a shred of empathy or understanding about this. In confessional, Cody says... Janelle looked in the marketplace for a day or a half hour and she immediately said she can't find a place so she's going to buy an RV. Cody and Janelle are now going to look at the trailer they bought sight unseen so Janelle can decide how much stuff she can fit in it. They are at the RV place now to scope it out and then they will pick it up in a few weeks. Cody says it's Janelle's birthday and they are now at the RV place to look at her birthday gift. He's almost suggesting that he bought it for her. Janelle says in confessional, Cody did not buy this for her. She doesn't know what he is talking about. She says it's more like her birthday gift she bought for herself. She bought it. Cody says he joked about it being a birthday gift. He never made any innuendo, he says, that he bought the RV for Janelle for her birthday. Cody says he doesn't want to be a negative Nelly, but
but he thinks it'll be cool one day to live in the RV, and the next day, he thinks it's ridiculous. Janelle says she hasn't even seen a picture of the RV, and she says it's everything you should not do when you buy something. Cody wanted to film the big reveal, and Janelle wanted to look at the RV first off camera. So they didn't film checking out the RV, checking out the trailer for the first time, because Cody says Janelle was too vulnerable. He wants to paint Janelle like she did an irrational thing, and now she's overly sensitive about it. She's overly emotional about it. Oh, she's so sensitive. I can't film her like she's regretting her decision. Like, look how foolish she is. He's so just condescending in the way he even frames anything to do with his wives. Oh, Janelle was independent. She did something stupid and foolish. Now look how vulnerable she is. She's too scared of what she did to be filmed. She's not confident in her choice as an independent woman. Oh, look how incapable she is. Look how foolish. He always loves to try to frame his wives as foolish as if he's superior to them. I don't like it. There was no need for him to mention that Janelle didn't want to be filmed. He didn't have to make a point to even mention it. Why did he do that? Rather than build up his wife and really support her and be proud of her for buying this RV on her own, he instead wants to make it look like she doubts her choice, like she's not confident in her choice, like she's having second thoughts, like she regrets it, like she was impulsive. Cody should be building his wife up and he should be proud of her rather than trying to make a point to point out how vulnerable she is, how she doesn't want to be filmed, how she is nervous about this because maybe she's doubting herself. She's so vulnerable about her bad choice. Instead of building his wife up and supporting her, he does what he can to make her look bad, to try and make himself look right, like look at the stupid impulsive decision my wife made that she didn't consult me on. He's a total dick. He should be lifting his wives up. Janelle says it's big, it's a massive trailer, and Cody says it's small, and he says it just seems big because they aren't in it. Janelle likes the trailer. She's glad it's so big because she and Savannah need to live there. Janelle is still moving forward in her life. She is trying to improve her situation and get a house built, but all around her, it feels like there is all of this chaos and uncertainty because Christine is leaving. Janelle wonders, what does it mean? Will the kids all come home all together for the holidays from now on? She feels like she is on this little path with these huge question marks all around her and all she can do is keep moving forward and try to be open and flexible to whatever the future looks like. Janelle and her sons are packing boxes and loading them. Janelle has just two and a half weeks till she has to vacate the rental. Her boys have been a godsend as far as moving and packing boxes. Cody explains that he and Janelle are in the middle of moving. They have to pick up the RV in a week or so. So in two and a half weeks, they have to be out of this house and they will have all of their stuff in storage units and they will be living in the RV. Cody says they are pretty strung out. How much effort towards the move other than putting his personal stuff at Robin's house or in storage, did Cody make? Did Cody stand alongside his sons and help Janelle with all of the stuff? Or did he just take out his own personal stuff? Cody says he knows some family members who cringe at the idea of he and Janelle living in the RV. Robin says she probably wouldn't consider living out on the property in an RV. She says there would not be enough room for herself and her five kids. There wouldn't be an RV big enough. Mary says living in an RV isn't something she would want to do unless she was traveling across the country. Cody is meeting with his friend and neighbor, Pete, who moves dirt. He is putting in culverts to prevent water from washing out the driveway. Cody says the whole thing makes him feel a lot of pressure to do a lot of something that they can't get done completely right now. It's a stretching of a budget that's got 
Then Cody sighs and he says, it's nerve wracking. Cody says, Christine's leaving doesn't change his motivation for putting five houses onto Coyote Pass. He thinks they can run out his property and Christine's lot and they can rent those out as an asset and it will help them to survive retirement. Cody says his life is in limbo because Christine is leaving and he doesn't know what that looks like. Cody has been in the anger phase of divorce, so he hasn't been addressing it well. So this project gets his mind out of his divorce frustration, but he is in the anger phase and every once in a while he gets tied up in knots about Christine leaving. Christine, Gwendolyn, and Truly are blowing up balloons and hanging banners and decorations in preparation for Isabel's graduation slash birthday party today. Isabel wants to travel after graduation, so it's a world theme. The food is done. They are doing the decorations. Christine needs everyone's help, including Isabel's, but Cody called Isabel to ask her to hang out with him. Christine almost lost it. She was really counting on Isabel's help because instead of Cody calling and asking if Christine or Isabel needed help with her party because Isabel is his daughter, Christine jokingly growls frustratedly. She has to have Gwen run a couple of errands and so she has Truly's help. Christine wants to support Cody's relationship with his kids. So she's going to play nice, but things aren't going to get done. Everyone in the family living in Flagstaff is coming to the party. Everyone either has a COVID test or they are vaccinated. And so everyone can hug and touch. And Isabel was hoping to get everybody together so everybody can hug. So that's what this is all about. Christine just told the adults a few weeks ago that she was leaving Cody and that she was moving back to Utah in September. They haven't talked since that discussion. Christine knew it was asking a lot of them to get together just two weeks after she told them that she was leaving Cody. But she also wanted to let them know that this might be one of the last times they all get together. Robin says Christine has told them she is leaving Cody for good. So Robin is a little bit nervous, wondering if they're gonna be able to be around each other and be normal and natural and comfortable, or if it's going to be tense. Robin seems worried about it. Christine doesn't know which kids in the family know she is leaving Cody. All of her kids know other than Truly and all of Janelle's kids know, but Christine doesn't know about Robin's kids or Leo. Janelle says her kids know Christine is leaving and she doesn't think Gabe and Garrison are that concerned about it because they have already talked about visiting Christine in Utah. They see this as a disruption and not a discontinuation. Robin has told all of her kids. Dayton, Aurora, and Brianna are sad and confused and frustrated. And Saul and Ari are so sad and so confused about Christine leaving. Christine says, for a lot of reasons, they haven't gotten together, COVID being one of them, as she rolls her eyes at that. Robin says, there are so many issues still kind of happening that it's just too raw to get together. She doesn't know exactly about this. Cody is glad the kids are all able to interact now. Christine says, this party is a little bit of a farewell for Isabel too, because in a couple of months, she and Isabel are driving across the country. They will drive to North Carolina. Isabel will go to school there and she will live with Maddie and Caleb. Everyone seems really happy and joyful interacting at the party. Cody is just like off seated in a corner. He looks like he's sulking. He doesn't look that happy. In confessional, Cody says that he's happy the kids are having a good time, but he can't get out from under this cloud of sadness and it's because of the nuance of a breakup. And Cody doesn't know what this is gonna lead to. He doesn't know what else is gonna go on. Janelle says right now she is just trying to be present here and just focus here at Isabel's party. Isabel says she thinks with her mom and dad getting a divorce, she saw it coming and of course she's sad about it, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. 
and Isabel is happy that her mom will be able to find somebody who she is really, really, really happy with. McKelty was relieved when she found out that her mom was leaving her dad. She says they aren't happy, they aren't in love. Tony thought it was inevitable. He can't imagine any man being perfect enough to be able to handle four wives. Cody says he has strained relationships with a bunch of his kids. He isn't in a good place with everybody. It's not that he's trying to be angry or hold them accountable in this moment, but he doesn't feel he gets the respect he should have. Cody says he isn't okay. He is here in a funk. It's a loneliness combined with a bitterness with the entire family. One thing I noticed is Christine and Robin seem to shop at the same store. Their tops were almost identical. And I have to say, Christine definitely wore it better. Christine gets the cake ready so everyone can sing Isabel happy birthday. Christine announces that it's a birthday slash graduation. Isabel is 18. And after Christine says this, Cody asks, are you sweet 17? He doesn't even know his daughter's age. And this is beyond pathetic. Isabel tells Cody she is almost sweet 18. This is an 18 party. And Cody says that will get Isabel a new car. Isabel says it was worth it. And Cody says it's worth it because she didn't waste her kisses on any stupid boys. This is so cringe. First of all, Cody didn't know Isabel's age. Then when he found out that she's going to be 18, he started saying that she's sweet 18 because she's never kissed a boy, so now she can get a new car. This is so cringe. Most teenagers realistically are going to kiss people that they are into, and most of the people you kiss, you don't marry. This idea that because Isabel hasn't kissed anyone yet and she is 18, she gets a car, it's so weird and cringe. Cody says a sweet 16 birthday party is a birthday party where the girl hasn't been kissed. Cody doesn't know where the term came from. He heard it in high school. It means a girl who has never been kissed. Cody says young men and women or men and women should be protecting themselves. He says you have to find trust before you are driven mad with sexuality. If you keep yourself puritanical and you are young and you build trust with a partner and then you marry them and you're eager to have sex with them so you marry them a little too soon before you even know yourself and the world and you make a lifelong commitment to them just so that you can have sex in a sanctified way and you do so before you understand life or the real world or yourself or romantic relationships or dating or sex and you don't even know who you are as a person yet or how your life is. You then become stuck in something you don't want to be stuck in because you are young and naive and you were told you had to wait till marriage to have sex. So you get married and you make a lifelong commitment to have sex. Your hormones are going. You're thinking you're doing this the right way. And the right way isn't necessarily getting married just so that you're able to have sex. And it doesn't mean the relationship will last or that you will go together. It's better to be safe and to be intimate and to live with a person and to really know them in good times and bad, mask on or off, and then marry them after living together after years, after figuring out yourself, after figuring out your life, after seeing the other person at their best and their worst. I would rather encourage living together and safe premarital sex than marrying someone before you even know who they are and making that lifelong commitment just to have sex in what is perceived as the right way. The trust you establish with a person, if you haven't lived with them and seen them in good times and bad, it's not really meaningful trust. If you don't actually really know all aspects of a person and making that commitment to get married, to be able to have sex, you don't really know a person fully and you don't know a person until you live with them and you know all of their quirks and you know how they are in good times and bad how they are under stress or under adversity. So whatever trust you build without that full relationship experience and really knowing the person isn't really real. It's just preliminary. It's not really deeply authentic. It's more surface level and it's flat. And then you feel all those lovey-dovey emotions and the hormones and you think you feel trust and you want to have sex and then you get stuck in a marriage just to do it the right way before you even know who you are in the world before you even know your head from your ass. 
I think it's much better to be realistic and practical and teach your kids about red flags and relationships and safe sex as they grow up rather than selling them on being chased and building trust and then making a lifelong commitment just to have sex in the right way with a person that you don't even really know, in my opinion. Isabel says, at her party, the family kind of jumped back to where they were before the thing with COVID, and it felt like a family again, and it was nice, she says. Everyone sings happy birthday. Robin says, it feels like old times, and she wants to hang on to this moment because she doesn't know when the next time will be. Robin wants to know more about the pictures Christine put out of Isabel from her birth on. Cody says what they're trying to do is they're trying to distract Isabel so they can set up for this song. They want to do a special song for Isabel. So they're setting up guitar and a mic. Aurora is playing guitar. Christine will sing and Gabe will join in and then everybody will join in. I thought the singing was a little off, but I thought it was sweet and heartwarming. I think that a couple of people really wanted to showcase their talents and outshine everyone. And I'm not talking about Christine. I personally can't stand this song. There was a bar I used to go to all the time where people would sing this song and Vanessa Carlton songs. And typically when I used to hear it, that's my cue to step outside because I don't like teeny bopper, like inspirational type songs. To me, it's just very cringe, especially to see middle-aged women karaoke this stuff in the bar when they're drunk and it's just completely ugh. But this was fitting for Isabel and I really thought despite the singing and whatever, it was very cute and it was very heart melty. Isabel cries, it's really cute. I can't stand this song personally and I even teared up. Because Isabel really deserves this. She deserves to feel all this love. Robin is excited to be there. It's healing. Isabel thinks the party was a success and everyone had a great time. Mary says Isabel glows with happiness. So it's going to be a bummer not to see her as often. Christine is proud of Isabel. She says Isabel is full of grace and kindness. She is sweet, but she also has so much strength. It was very sweet and heartwarming to see the love Christine has and the admiration she has for her daughter. Christine says, Isabel has dealt with so much like scoliosis and migraines. She had it harder than the rest of her kids. Yet here she is glowing and shining and amazing. Christine says, Isabel is an amazing person. Janelle says, Isabel is going to move to North Carolina to live with Maddie and Caleb and it will be great for Isabel because Isabel will be able to get out and experience the world outside of her mom's home and outside of Flagstaff, but she will still be in a safe, protective environment because Maddie and Caleb will be there. Robin says it's strange because they're in this moment having a nice time and she wonders, how is this wrong? How does this not work for everybody? She asks, why isn't this something worth fighting for or staying for? Robin says she hopes constantly. She hopes that maybe something will spark for someone and they will think it's worth figuring this out and sticking around because Robin would look at this and think that this could make Christine think, hey, this is worth staying for. Robin believes God can make miracles happen. Instead of God changing Christine's mind, why doesn't she hope God changes Cody's heart and brain and spirit so that his behavior will change and he will, by some miracle, become capable of being the husband and father the family deserves? Maybe Robin should put that on her vision board. It's interesting to me that Robin doesn't seem to think it's on Cody to change. It's on God changing Christine's mind. Christine is the one to change. He believes Christine should know after a few random moments at a family party where everyone plays nice for Isabel's sake that she should stay in a marriage with an absent husband and an absent father who gives everyone in the family less than they deserve. She should stay even though she's not ever going to get what she deserves. She should stay even though maybe those kind of heartwarming moments are only like that maybe twice a year at best. 
Mary says, when she looks at days like this, when they're all together and smiling, setting the crap aside, she wonders why can't they work on the things that they need to work on between each other. She says they aren't doing justice to their family, and they aren't doing justice to Ari, Saul, and Truly, to the little ones who need that security and that family. Mary is devoted to doing what she needs to do, but she knows that not everyone is. I'm going to give Mary grace here and assume that she's referring to Cody and no one else when she says that comment. Janelle says, it feels like there are storms brewing in the family. She doesn't know what they mean or what the outcome will be. She personally isn't very optimistic that they will see very many days like this. Christine says, Cody isn't one to hide his emotions though. He will show you how he is feeling. And she says he's sad and it's bittersweet. Christine says Cody loves Isabel and he hasn't spent enough time with her. And Christine thinks Cody is probably realizing that. Cody says this evening has gone off without a hitch. It's been wonderful. He thinks Isabel has felt very special. He is just blue. Cody says they will never be there again if they really go through with this. If Christine is leaving. He asks, is she really going to leave? Cody says he is living in a delusional world where he is wishing that Christine wouldn't leave. He is wishing that Isabel would go to school here and they would be able to maintain some quasi-family relationship. Cody says he is struggling with a state of regret and frustration. He says it's a weird thing to be getting left. It's made him question getting into plural marriage. It's made him question his faith and especially question his religion. He says the message that they had to the world about functional polygamy seems so dysfunctional now. I knew it. I knew Cody would eventually start to blame the lifestyle itself and how difficult it is on the man, the unattainable expectations the wives have of their husband with multiple women being married to the same man under the lifestyle. He's going to say it's just too much. He's going to blame the lifestyle rather than blame himself and his faults. Cody is going to say he, as the man who signed up for this, is a victim of the lifestyle. It's the lifestyle that is complicated. He is a victim of plural marriage and of the faith. The fault isn't on him. The fault is on the faith. The fault is on the lifestyle with unrealistic expectations. And this is not his fault. It's not his fault that he can't hold up his end of the agreement that they all signed up for. Polygamy, plural marriage is just too hard. It's too complicated. His family isn't working. It's not a functional plural family, not because of Cody and how incapable and inept he is. It's because of the lifestyle. It just isn't functional and it has nothing to do with him that this didn't work. Cody is going to blame the lifestyle and the faith hardcore now. He's going to say it had nothing to do with him and his behavior. It had nothing to do with his manipulative and emotionally abusive ways. It had nothing to do with his toxic behavior. It had nothing to do with his refusal to compromise. It had nothing to do with his refusal to do his best to not have a favorite wife and with his refusal to do things fair and equally. The fault is on his independent wives and his disrespectful kids and on the lifestyle. And the fault is on the toxic, impossible, dysfunctional lifestyle of polygamy. So no one should ever point the finger at him. Cody consciously chose plural marriage. He chose this faith. He committed to four women. He signed up for this. And now, because he no longer wants to invest in it and he doesn't want to sacrifice or to be inconvenienced by the consequences of his choice to live plural marriage, he doesn't want to do the constant rotating from house to house. He doesn't want to do the managing of his wife's expectations. The realities of being there as a present invested father to his 18 kids are too much for Cody. Cody doesn't want to be inconvenienced. He doesn't want to make the effort. So Cody now wants to blame it all on the lifestyle and he wants to burn the house down so he can finally be rid of the obligation without taking a shred of accountability for his fault in this. 
He constantly reminds his wives this is what they signed up for. He always says his kids need to own their choices. But I don't see Cody owning his choices. I don't see Cody recognizing his responsibility in this or acknowledging his mistakes or his faults as a father and a husband. I don't see Cody respecting his family. All I see Cody doing is claiming he doesn't get the respect he deserves when he respects no one, not even himself. All he does is stew in his anger, lamenting that he isn't the revered hero in the story of his family. Next time on Sister Wives, Christine and Cody have a talk. Christine tells Cody she needs to tell Truly about the move to Utah, and Cody doesn't know how he feels about it. He says it feels hostile to him. He doesn't want to be antagonistic or disagreeable, but he doesn't want to agree to anything. Christine visits Janelle at the trailer. Janelle is boondocking. There is no septic. There is no water and there is no power. Christine says it's great. She's very positive. She says it's big. Cody says he doesn't want to live in the trailer. He says Janelle has a tiny little kitchen and a tiny little house and a tiny little bathroom. He asks, why am I going to sit here and suffer with you with your choices? See, Janelle asked Cody if he would stay in the trailer with her, and he said yes. Now he is complaining that it's too small. He doesn't want to live there. He doesn't want to suffer in that trailer because of Janelle's poor choices. He wants to make an excuse as to why he can't go over to Janelle's to give her fair and equal time. COVID is no longer an excuse, so now he wants to say that because Janelle made the stupid choice to live in the trailer and he didn't get any input, he doesn't have to suffer in it. It's too cramped. He won't be staying there and he will blame Janelle for picking the trailer and not involving him in the decision. And he will blame the trailer as to why he can't stay there. See, COVID is done now and he made another barrier as to why he can't be a father or a husband at Janelle's house. He's now going to refuse to stay in the trailer. It was Janelle's choice. It wasn't his choice and he won't suffer for it. He won't be there with her. He will use her decision to get the trailer as an excuse as to why he can't be there. And he will put all the accountability and all the blame on Janelle when in reality, it's Cody's choice as a husband and a father to decide not to be there and his choice to make up irrelevant excuses as to why he can't be there is on him when he just doesn't want to be there, period, and he knows that. He will grasp at straws to find reasons why he can't be there. Just because he doesn't want to sacrifice or be inconvenienced to be a father and a husband. He refuses to sacrifice with Isabel. It was too cold to sit outside with her. If she chose in-person school over him, he wasn't going to see her. It would be too inconvenient. With Janelle, the trailer is too small. If he has to sacrifice or be inconvenienced at all in any way, he sees that as a rational justification as to why he cannot be there and as to why he was prevented from doing things fair and equally as a father and a husband. He will use any small sacrifice or inconvenience as a reason as to why he was prevented from being an active, present, invested husband and father. And that's Cody's choice to make on Cody. It's not on any of his wives or any of his kids. Yet Cody wants to bitch that he isn't respected and he isn't the adored patriarch. Christine says, McKelty called her and they were talking about her moving to Utah and Christine looked behind her and there was truly overhearing everything. It was the worst conversation of her life. That does it for this episode. I want to remind everyone to please check out the adorable cooking show, Cooking with Just Christine, that's available on TLC's website and Instagram page. New episodes come out every Sunday along with Sister Wives. To my YouTube viewers, please like and subscribe. And let me know your thoughts in the comments section if you like. I'll see you guys soon. Thanks for listening. Bye.